So what the heck is going on here? This graph right here represents the purple line is new cases per million. And the date we're looking at right here is from January about 10th to about today, February 14th. And it is, by the way, February 14th at 1.34 a.m. for our usual time for the data analytic hour. So basically what we're looking at right here is this. We're, in order to come out with this mortality percentage, we are simply taking the new deaths per million divided by the new cases per million and basically arriving at a percentage. This is what's been occurring recently, and I think this is kind of given a reason for a lot of researchers to pause because the drop in cases is so incredibly precipitous that basically it's causing this ebb and flow, whereas there's less people infected, those which are currently infected, even though it could be dying at the same number, uh, passing away at the same number, it's re representing or resulting in a far higher percentage in reference to mortality. So a greater percentage of people are dying from COVID that are infected, but less people amazingly are becoming infected. And this drop is so incredible uh, in reference to how far and how fast the slope has changed. It, it People are perplexed. It has nothing to do with vaccines one way or the other. Even though there's a strong correlation between percentage of the globe vaccinated and mortality. But again, unless the virus is sentient and can actually adapt its behavior based upon vaccines, now who would ever think of that? Uh, basically, that's most likely just a strange correlation. So in this case, what we're looking at here is basically mortality, which is red, and purple right here is those fully vaccinated. And yes, it does follow a fairly predictive correlation. But again, correlation, does not mean a causative argument. So here we have this basically this incredible, incredible drop uh, like in the middle of nowhere, like right here, uh, that all of a sudden just happened right around the beginning of the year. So that's just to give you an idea. And the numbers here, just to give you a little bit of a refresher. All right, let's say, for example, here's your new death smooth per million, new cases smooth per million, and your mortality percentage, and people fully vaccinated. Now you start right here, keep an eye on this one right here, when 0.01% of the world is fully vaccinated, there's your new death smooth per million, new cases smooth per million, of course, this is divided by this, and then we arrive at the percentage. And as we go down here and you follow this line, and remember this is filmed in 4K, this may be a little difficult to see, but give it a few days and it should be processed fully on YouTube. But you look down here, here is your percentage of the globe vaccinated. And now there is your new death smooth per million. See how it's beginning to drop. But here, look at this. New cases smooth per million. The OWID world means the entire planet. Look at how fast that drop is. It is just perplexing and astounding. Down to 51.2. That's what gives you this incredible, incredible, incredibly precipitous drop in that slope, which is just perplexing for a lot of researchers because no one would have ever predicted this fast, uh, this quick, literally within what, about 30 plus days. All right, let's get right into the research as follows. We'll come back to this in a second, but let's start with the research, which is pretty interesting. First, let's get past this. Uh, Montana is no, longer, is no longer requiring a face mask. Uh, North Dakota is no longer requiring a face mask. Mississippi, as well as other in Iowa, uh, basically last week. So what we did, and I want to close this out right here, we added this to our watch list. So when we go to hospital occupancy, we will have Mississippi. There's your green is your uh, inpatient beds used with COVID. Uh, starts back from May all the way up to February. And we had Mississippi, Montana to our watch list. Uh, North Dakota is added to our watch list. In Iowa, does not mean they are doing, they're performing poorly. In fact, that can mean the exact opposite, because we're looking for some sort of correlation between social distancing and mask use. And uncomfortable it may sound for a lot of individuals. You do need to have controls. These states are now controls. We had Florida as a control before, meaning 
people which are not really abiding by the global position in reference to pandemic mitigation, face masks, physical distancing, and so on and so forth, and to see how they perform. And right now, uh, as we look at the data in a few seconds, they seem to be performing actually better, which could be an argument for or against dysbiosis. But let us begin with the news articles as follows. Let's start with the important stuff. Disinfectants. Disinfectants being used in the age of COVID-19 is resulting in a lot, a lot of uncontrolled asthma outbreaks. Now keep in mind this observational study or survey was conducted among those that had asthma. Of those individuals in the survey that had asthma, within the past four weeks, 40% almost reported uncontrolled asthma. And there, for example, if you want to look at this chart right here, these are the number of respondents using disinfectant as proposed before, obviously being, you know, concerned about that safety issue. And this gives you an idea of the increase in the percentage of individuals use in disinfectants. Now, a lot of people which have asthma don't recognize that disinfectants can be a major trigger for asthmatic attacks. Now, what they're doing is they're not recommending against sanitation. What they're recommending is using uh, disinfectants, which can be uh, less reactive to an asthmatic. Apple cider vinegar, soap, things along those lines, as opposed to chemically based disinfectants. So that's a really important article for a lot of individuals that do have asthma concerns. After that, Canada came with information. Now, the researcher is what they want to do is they want to compile the differences now that all the information is coming out. We have larger groups of individual, individuals which are infected. So you have more uh, uniformity to the data, kind of like a bell curve. The data, as they say right now, is this is how much more likely an individual will be in the hospital or how much longer or more likely they'll be used ICU and their chance of risk of death. Currently, as it stands, it's about 1.5 times greater than influenza. Now, even though they are stating it is greater, you remember how this was um, reported in the very beginning. I don't want to call it embellishment uh, of data, but they tried to get people's attention and they said some pretty um, high numbers. Now, those numbers since then have been found to be erroneous. And But however, too, the researcher stated here, which is real important, is the fact is that this is still fairly new. And as time goes on, it'll probably not even be as high as it is currently. Now, there are proponents of vaccination and social distancing and masks and so on and so forth, but the only proponents of that until there's an opportunity to put this is basically uh, more pronounced in the community and people develop their own immune system or immune, uh, better immune responses to it. And even though they were mentioned vaccine and things like that, you have to remember though the influenza vaccine itself, they've been off mark now for like, who knows, an untold number of years. But this also gives credence to the research we covered a few weeks ago, where basically SARS-CoV-2, now if you look at this number here, that's about two and a quarter years, which we've already been in this for about a year, so about a year and a quarter, will basically have infection fatality ratio way below that of influenza. So don't be surprised if they start trying to dump vaccines in the market by the drove, because if this is the case, even without counting a vaccine into this data, then yeah, you're going to see a, a, a large surplus of supply of vaccines. We'll get back to that in a second. All right, let's go into the next one. Just real briefly, most people are naturally armed against SARS-CoV-2. Again, not an argument against uh, distancing or whatever it is, but they're just trying to say is basically these antibodies can be there and there's they're recommending even using vaccines or some sort of inoculation uh, to basically get those antibodies charged ahead of time. So they're saying most people are naturally armed against SARS-CoV-2. This doesn't mean there's not a subgroup, which is very susceptible. And that's really where a lot of the pandemic mitigation 
you know, as a 2020 hindsight should have went towards uh, was protecting those groups first. I don't want to get into a political statement in reference to uh, sending infected individuals to uh, nursing facilities and encouraging it in the state of California, New York, and even worse, hiding the data because a lot of the nation and a lot of global response was based upon data, which is obviously now found out to be defunct. For example, if you were in New York and you did a, a pretty solid pandemic mitigation strategy, incorporating harsh rules in reference to social distancing and mass use and things like that, and you hid the mortality data, uh, it can make it look like those pandemic mitigation strategies are actually working when reality it's not. And then you basically obviously use that as an example for nationwide mandates based upon um, erroneous data. And you have a lot worse collateral damage in reference to school shutting down businesses and so forth. And of course, I don't want to get political, but that's why it's real important. All right, after that, this is for my friends, which have that little conspiratorial side to them. A lot of them are concerned about the 5G thing. And I'm not going to say the 5G thing because I don't want to have my video banned. But I want to give you an, an aspect of what 5G is primarily going to be used for in the future and how that may play a role in pandemic mitigation. And it's important for basically psychological well-being. Now, what we're looking at right here is an article. I know it sounds off, but if you think about it for a while, you can actually draw a relationship. All right, so here it is, looking at 5G. What they're attempting to do is attempting to make sure that they have a system which could protect itself against potential human threats. And so basically what they call security threats and countermeasures before they begin. And this is where the 5G truly comes in and not so much the need to put a chip in a vaccine or whatever it is. That's, 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 that's old school technology. This is how brilliant these people are. Now, keep in mind, many may see this as being inherently evil in the wrong hands, but you still have to give credit. These are incredibly ingenious individuals as far as developing a system as such. And are you ready? Here we go. Again, I'm not trying to be more the researcher. It's how the research is used, which concerns us, not so much the incredible breakthrough in reference to the research. All right, what they discovered is this. They have a way of reading emotions through 5G. Does that mean reading emotions through your cell phone or any sort of electronics that you have on you? Let's debunk that right off the bat. It's called the Vimeo Sys, which can detect human emotions using wireless signals and body movement. Emotions are critical characteristics of human beings and separate humans from machines to find a daily human activity. However, some emotions can also disrupt normal functioning of a society. I'm only reading and you can, you can, you know, wander away mentally, uh, function society and put people's lives in danger, such as unstable drivers and so on and so forth. All right, but let's proceed a little forward. The virtual motion system developed by brilliant individuals, uh, can recognize these five kinds of emotions. I'm talking at a distance and not with anything on you, joy, pleasure, a neutral state, sadness, and anger. And it's composed of three subsystems dealing with the detection, flow, mapping of human, and, and mapping of human emotions and detection. All right, da, 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 right there. kind of correct. The system of concern with detection is called artificial intelligence virtual emotion barrier, otherwise known as AI Vima bar. If that's how you say it, which relies on reflection, reflection of wireless signals from a human subject to detect emotions. The emotion information is then handled by the system concerned with the flow, uh, called artificial intelligence virtual emotion flow. Makes sense. All right, which enables the flow of specific emotion information at a specific time to a specific area. Blah, blah, blah. They utilize a large amount of do, 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 do. All right, let's move forward. Look for the threat detection and crime prevention, i.e., here's a nice example. A notable advantage of the system is it allows emotion detection without revealing the face or private parts of the subject thereby protecting the privacy of citizens in public areas. So you think. Moreover, in private areas, it gives the user the choice to remain anonymous while providing information to the system. Furthermore, when a serious emotion, such as anger or fear, is detected in a public area, the information is rapidly conveyed to the police department or relative entities 
who can then take steps to prevent any potential crime or terrorism threat. So here you have your 5G system. All right. So for example, let's say, you know, whatever reason you have and there's a, a, a riot or a protest or whatever it is, or you're even outside in the park or just jogging and you get pretty angry. The 5G system that they're utilizing is so advanced, it can detect your emotion, whether you have your cell phone on or not. Again, so for those which are interested in 5G, I'll throw this in there because we have time tonight and not a lot of research reference uh, to COVID uh, release this week. But however, though, there is your 5G concerns. So if 5G is a concern, people are going, oh, it can mutate certain things, whatever it is. Not saying it can't, but this is the direction where you're going to see it headed more often than not is detecting behavior, whether you're connected to the system or not. All right, now let's get back to data analytics uh, as such. Let's start with number one, COVID auto world, audit world, auto world. All right, so here we go. Da, 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 running to the top. And let's see what we got here. Again, I'm looking at it for the first time as both you are. All are. New cases move per million, new deaths move per million. There's a freaking drop. Mortality percentage of positive cases is looking at the whole planet. There it's beginning to rise. And let's make this a little bigger. Boom, boom, boom. And oh, did it make it bigger? No, it did. Ah, there it goes. All right. There's the numbers. New cases smooth per million, death smooth per million. We kind of were redundant. We already looked at that. Here we go. Our, look at this. The drop in cases. I know there's such poor international reporting in the United States. And right now, they all it, it, no one wants to report on the good news or they're being overly cautious and trying not to get people's hopes up. But look at this. Great Britain. And this also gives you two... Because you have Sweden in there, which has very, very mild pandemic mitigation measures. And when you Sweden, you spare control. But this is happening across the globe. And of course, our Asian friends, it's like it's like COVID what? Uh, but here we are. Great Britain, look at this. Uh, let's look at Sweden. Sweden's in purple. Drop. And of course, the United States, which is in pink. Just massive drop. And let's get, look at the, when we take when we break that part up and we go back, uh, I think close to 30 days. Look at this. Actually, I should go back a little further, but that's yeah, 30 days. Look at that drop. Look how that again, not just not just in these you know in Sweden and Great Britain, and the United States, and of course, I love to count our Asian friends, but they barely make the graph. They just like rest it on the x-axis. Look at that. Why is the media not representing this to the public? more than anything else. The media, I don't know what media means, but you know, we rely on basically f a few major news outlets. You know, what the heck? That should be major news. All right, let's keep on proceeding forward. All right, I highlighted this drop right here because this is, of course, COVID as we go along. And then these new cases move per million, then all of a sudden, boom, crash. And then this is our cases to positivity rate. Now I did hear for those that analytics, these are new cases smooth per million. Look at this. I didn't even see that number. We're now below the 300 cases per million from January 11th to February 12th. Look at that. All right, now if you look at right here, is your positivity rate. And for those in data analytics, I did a forward fill. So that's what you're looking at as a forward fill. And right now we're down to point, we went from 0.12 to 0.97. So that gives you an idea. Let's proceed forward. There is our freaking drop from January 11th, as you can see. Look at that. I mean, every time I look at this data and I look at this drop, I, I mean, it's in the United States we are doing less testing, without a doubt. But a lot of places in the uh, other places in the world, they're actually increasing the amount of testing, and you, we'll look in a second on the data charts, and it's still dropping precipitously, especially like in the United Kingdom. They're doing more testing, trying to find more cases. And having a harder and harder time finding those cases. But, I mean, you cannot help but look at these figures and to look at that slope and just take pause and go, wow, what is going on? All right. And you don't hear any word from a lot of the other places like the IHME and places like that, which are predicting mass, you know, the apocalypse uh, until a vaccine was actually effective in the environment for a long period of time. 
this is just happening now. You don't hear any any of those talking heads anymore, those thought leaders, we call them. Here we are, a new test smooth per thousand. This is basically in uh, U.S., but you wear less uh, testing, but yes, even less cases, but the rest of the world goes the other way. Here we are, a new deaths per million. Um, here's Sweden. Remember, Sweden didn't, uh, this is deaths per million. Now, keep in mind the different strategies here. The United States is that, so we're comparing apples and apples. Sweden didn't, I mean, it went to a mass level one, meaning they recommended it. But however, though, it wasn't anything like, for example, what we have here in the United States. And they decided to just stand by and do virtually nothing except protect those which are most vulnerable. So you get to compare those mitigation strategies. And they didn't, they didn't lock down like we locked down. And look what happened. Look what we've maintained. Constant numbers consistently. All right. There's Sweden. There's United States. Of course, they'll report on the news when Sweden starts becoming like the United States. But however, though, they don't tell you anything after that. It just really gives you a really dwarfed perception. All right, let's proceed. Da, da, da. Now we're going to go to the United States versus all of Asia. So basically, we're here, for those not familiar, we compare the U.S. Um, mortality statistics to, I know what sounds macabre, but again, we're trying to look for controls. I'll compare it to all of Asia. So here is U.S. right here. And here is... All of them, is just, if you treat them just as one country compared to the U.S. And these are our Asian friends. And so here's our data. Deaths per million. The closest to the United States, as far as not faring as well, is Armenia. And everyone else seems to be doing uh, pretty, uh, I don't want to say well, they seem to be doing better. Uh, but here we are, the mortality. The United States versus all of Asia is India and Iran, and so on and so forth. And there's Turkey, and yeah. So again, I know they try to make it sound like the apocalypse, but a lot of the focus is only on the United States. So this is why I found that doing this data analytic real important to give people perspective outside of our borders. All right, Asia, population 4 billion, 463 million. Total mortality of all of Asia, 384,584. The United States, total population, 329 million, approx. U.S. total mortality, 480,887. So, again, look at that. And we're talking a tremendous number of variables. Uh, all, all across Asia, being so much a greater landmass, different governments and so on and so forth, different pandemic mitigation strategies, everything. And yet the United States, for whatever reason... You would think would be healthier, the large uh, prospect of most of, this, uh, of most of the continent. Then people say, "Well, we live longer," things like that. No, 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 no. That didn't play. That doesn't seem to be, have play any correlation. However, though this figure to this figure, that's a lot of explaining. And here we are uh, looking at Asia per se uh, mortality rate of one out of every eleven thousand six hundred four, compared to mortality rate in the United States of one out of every six hundred eighty four. One out of every eleven thousand six hundred four for Asia, one out of eight one in six hundred eighty four for the United States. I mean, seriously, think about that. Let's go down here. Here's the world. Uh, new cases moved. Now I want to count the vaccine data coming in here. Yes, the vaccine came out at the same time, but obviously such a small percentage of the population was vaccinated that it just. But how are the correlation and timing in the rapid change in behavior of the virus? just seems bizarre science fiction like that's the best way i could describe it because that it's like bizarre because you, you're not looking at greater sunshine or whatever it is you're not looking at a lot of factors people more you're not looking at a massive behavior change between here and here and then this all right here we are there's our correlation again it's interesting new cases per million people fully vaccinated you could say that if you didn't have all the data, you would say, oh, there's a strong correlation between uh, vaccines and transmission. And you'd also say there's a strong correlation between vaccines and mortality percentage. So think about that. Obviously, there's not, but it still looks like that. Uh, however, then I broke up this just a little closer date, I think. Yeah, I broke the date up to December 14th to see if I had any, any difference in the figures. Not much. So here we are. And pair plot, player plot, boo, boo, boo. 
Again, new deaths move per million divided by new cases move per million give us more mortality percentage. We covered this. There's other charts. There's that incredible X. Uh, percentages, vaccine to mortality correlation. This is just to give you an idea on how you can manipulate data to give the false impression. Again, the only way that you're really going to have a vaccine to mortality correlation this early in the game is a couple different ways. It's a couple nefarious and a couple uh, more on the sci-fi line. Uh, again, in what you could define as sentient and not. But here we are, and there's our data. Do, do, do. There is our predictive model. Uh, so far, it's been on target. I'm just trying to say, you know, it's it, you know, it, it's not a causative, but there is a correlate. I mean, it's, it's you can use it to predict. We'll see next week as well. And there's our sample quantiles if you're into QQ plots. And then this is our residuals. I think I messed up on this. I don't think I fitted it properly, so I wouldn't pay too much attention to that. And so let's go to the next one. I'd like the residuals. I mean, the residuals could be right, but I don't think I have it fitted properly. So that's data aspects. The investigator part, let's go to the next one. All right. This is where we're looking for correlations. Again, uh, our correlations uh, seem to match on the heat maps. But however, though, we can't find a solid correlation. Oh, the fully vaccinated popped up. It wasn't there last time. So let's see. Looking for... Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. Cardiovascular death rates. New deaths moon per million. And let's see the uh, people fully vaccinated. Let's go this. Life expectancy, median age, human development index, interesting. No, population density. So people fully vaccinated per 100 seems to correlate with population density pretty strongly. Uh, but population as a whole, not necessarily. I'm just looking at this for the first time as with you. Uh, total deaths per million, not correlated yet. Remember, you need to have a 0.7, negative or positive, either way. So nothing really, obviously, is too early to show. So let's keep on going down. Life expectancy, it's currently, Japan may have had a few deaths. I'm just going to go down to, for expediency. Do, 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 do. All right, all the countries doing better than the United States. I know it sounds condescending to the country I love. But however, though, let's look at we're looking at the data. We have great, great scientists, but uh, this pandemic became politicized and really made science a nightmare. Trust me, a lot of researchers, which come with a lot of good research, are terrified and have been not reporting figures which do not coincide with a party line, a party line. All right, I'm not saying both, all parties involved are at fault for basically making science really, really, really a stress, more stressful than it needed to be. So here we have the United States, uh, deaths per million, and in all these countries are doing better deaths per million than the United States. And so we're at a 9.51. When we started reporting on this, we were at 3.6. And so we've actually become far worse in deaths per million than we were before. All right, let's go on there. Let's world masks. See if there's any correlation since masks are such an emotional uh, attachment to all of us. So basically, here we are on both sides, whether you like them or not, there is some emotion invested one way or the other. Uh, Zimbabwe, February, so our data is up to date. Do, do, do. February must have been the last mask report. Now keep in mind, too, uh, even though the stringency index, for example, all right, here's our facial coverings. No correlations with anything. Uh, even though you know you see these mask mandates to a level of four, it's like the United States. We showed four states, for example, that uh, like like Iowa and Mississippi, you know, and so on and so forth. That Montana and yeah, you know, dropping out of the mask, uh, you know, the mask requirements. So you'll see United States here will be like a um, like be like a four. Yeah, but reality, I don't know why Oxford and our world and Dana has it adjusted to that, to some sort of basically a median based upon all the individual states because it's not a four, because all the country, all the states are not having a mask mandate. 
So it throws me off. And of course, we have our few countries over here. Japan's a one. Yemen is one. Sweden's a one. Watch Sweden go back down to nothing again. New Zealand's only a two. And you think it would be higher, but it's not. Uh, let's go our world. This is important. There are mask levels. If you could find a correlation, there's our drop in cases. Uh, this, these charts are important really because we're going to go by testing. The United States has done less testing. But now let's look at the other countries. Some of our countries are controls. All right, this is test per thousand. This is cases per million. All right. You see there, do, do, do. Japan, look at that. This is uh, right as test per thousand, but look how fast the cases per million have dropped. Look at that. Uh, like to 11 cases per million. New Zealand, a little different than the data. They're at about, uh, they're at now one case per million. One, a little bit below one case per million. Finland, they're basically, look at that, they're pretty high. You wouldn't think so. They're about 60, they're close to 70 cases per million. And their tests go hand in hand. India, look at this. What do you think? So here you have India. Look at think of this. India at about what? Like like five cases per million. And you have Finland at 60, 70 cases per million. Think about how confounding that is. All right. And then look at the testing. Testing's gone up, but cases per million tend to go down. Uh, continue to go down. All right, so there we are. And then Spain. All of a sudden, I don't know whether it's up in test, the testing or not, but all of a sudden, look at that. Look at the drop. Look at that drop. Spike. Boom. Right up to that New Year's and just sort of dropping like a rock after that. Let's see. Here we go. France. Same thing. So we're seeing a type of global event. I mean, that's the weird part about it. We're talking different climates, different populations, different geographies all across the globe. And it's happening at the exact same time. The drop in cases is happening simultaneously in areas with different climates, different seasons, so on and so forth, at the exact same time. Look at this. Look at the United Kingdom. I brought that up earlier. Look at the tests per thousands and the cases per million. All about that exact same time time like it was like someone just pushed a button and then boom those cases began to drop all right so let's go back that we covered to the bottom here i think we did oh there's italy and again cases per million not as much for drop but look at the testing cases per million and of course there's a numerical that doesn't mean it can't go back up but whatever it is it's in concert across the globe operating the behavior of the virus if you should call it behavior is operating as a whole in so many different geographies at the exact it's a behavior in almost the exact same way with even regardless of the number of variants they try to scare you with or whatever it is so this is more transmissible this is not more bottom line of it if things are more transmissible your cases would not be dropping like a rock Think about that, but at the exact same time, regardless of the pandemic mitigations factors, regardless of whatever the season is in that particular part of the world, regardless of the population density, average age, stringency index, so on and so forth, everything that we thought we had control over in the virus that we could help control its behavior doesn't seem to make a difference. But something's happening, but that is really weird. The check the states out as far as looking at everything else. Do, 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 if I could speak this late. It's only 2 in the morning now. All right, here we go. Here are our states. Da, 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 da. I remember I started adding Iowa to the to our model. All right, there we are. Remember, because Iowa dropped the face mask thing last, uh, last week. Here we are. California, blue. Florida, orange. New York, red. Don't think of it like a contest. And, of course, Iowa, green. And but thinking about now, Iowa obviously had, does not have any mask mandate. But think of it basically is can you use you're trying you're you're working as a data scientist on your own 
and you're trying to determine which pandemic mitigation strategy works best, if anything makes a difference at all, you have to make you have to be the judge of that. All right, here we are: California, Florida, Iowa, New York. Again, this is da da da. Let's go. That's logarithmic. Mortality increases, positives per hundred thousand. You tell me. Uh, this is more of a brief aspect. This goes from January fourth, and so we look at New York here. Florida, which is not doing as good as California, but again, you tell me. Uh, now, for example, the only difference is here, pandemic mitigation strategies, which are severe, like in California and New York, do have a, uh, an effect of hurting a lot of people collaterally, and also besides damaging the economy and so, so on and so forth. So either of you basically come to say, well, what difference does it make about reference to a pandemic mitigation strategy causing unnecessary harm and suffering? And your why your why your plan is not working doesn't make you a really good leader. So I like proceed this for I don't care about political affiliation. It just basically think about it. All right, deaths per hundred thousand. Iowa had this little peak there at about eight, and then it just dropped. And um, now Florida and Iowa, without much pandemic mitigation uh, restriction, are. Now doing better than New York and California. And death increases per 100,000, da, 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 so on and so forth. Again, it's not my opinion. It's just numerical. If the numbers don't stand for it, then basically this is your uh, death increase. Then then why? You have to, what are you basing your policies upon if you're not basing it upon actual data? Hospital occupancy, talking about data. Here we go again. Ready? So here we go. Da, da, da. All right. Here we pay attention to here, right there, as far as your data, because uh, public health services, whatever it is, really messed up big time uh, on reference to uh, Alaska. Right here, you're going to see right there 144% in inpatient bed utilization, and that was reported as of uh, February 10th, even though you only had 2% of inpatients with COVID. Now keep in mind this is why I use multiple data sources. All right, but let's proceed here. You know, you can see me fix this in a second. All right, there you are. Total IC beds, IC beds use estimate. All right, you see that number there? Now the red line, for those not familiar, red line is the historical hospital occupancy with inpatient beds used. All right. Let's back this up now. It's too close. Uh, so that's the historical. And remember, though, California decided to go into some sort of uh, quasi martial law and quarantines, and everything else like that. But reality, it didn't really go above the standard norm. Now, this right here is actually a reporting error. I'm really going to be curious to see how many news agencies don't vet their data. And even though this is from, I think, the Public Health and Human Services, uh, the data, it, you know, we checked the other data sources from the U.S. government. It doesn't coincide with this, and neither does anything else. So, but however, though, if you look at this right off the bat, who's going to report that Alaska has 144% uh, ICU capacity overload? So, everything else, the orange, of course, is your individuals with COVID, which are in the hospitals. So, you have California as a high percentage, Arizona, Texas, Georgia. Maryland, New York, and Guam. Now, it's really interesting because, again, it's you're trying to look for patterns. And, you know, those patterns don't necessarily hold. It seems almost, I don't want to say it's random, but it's interesting. Let's get forward. Percentage of in-bed bed utilization, percentage of in-bed utilization, inpatient and IC bed utilization. All right, and that can go in. Here's our data frame. And healthdata.gov is the source that I used, and you'll see me look for the correction and reference that data in a second. All right, there's our Alaska. This is actually the real numbers. Uh, inpatient beds use COVID, and again, was it two? So that gives you an idea. And yet, it seems like all the vaccines are going to Alaska. So here we are, California. Massive drop. In basically that inpatient beds used, and that's all up to date uh, this February. And there's your aspect there, your, your gap between inpatient beds and those used. 
and a lot of them could be staffing issues. New York, same thing. You're seeing a drop. So be curious when the state of emergency is going to end. Florida, remember, they were Florida. They could have been looking at going. Oh, we have to, have, we, you know, they like they were trying some sort of contest. They were like the apocalypse was going to hit Florida. Well, a lot of very smart people that made a lot of dire predictions were completely wrong. Uh, so because they based it upon hypotheses which were flawed. Let's put it that way. So that's being be nice. And here's our four states with no mask mandates any longer. Iowa. Again, you're not going to see any of this in the news because why are they going to report it? Iowa and North Dakota. Pay attention to the green lines. The reason being the green line more than the, the orange line here is because a lot of people that have been waiting for elective surgeries, heart surgeries, cancer, and so on and so forth, uh, they're going to fill those beds, which were originally reserved for COVID individuals. So that's why the inpatient bed use is really going to be uh, going to throw people off. Go by the green line instead. All right, so inpatient bed use. And these are the states which have dropped the mask mandates. And so in Mississippi, why is this one a little shorter? Look at that. There it is. And so they have a lot of beds comparatively to other places as a ratio. But still, look at that. That's pretty low. It's a pretty solid drop. And so let's see if there's any more data below this. Uh, Alaska. Yeah, here's the Alaska. Here's the actual data. So February 13th, they had 1,521 active beds, inpatient beds available, and only 902 are used. So it's not 144%. So that's your actual real data from, I believe, the uh, healthdata.gov. So there's our other facts as far as that. Oh, boom, boom. And now we're going to go to the vaccine usage. You ready? Here we go. Vaccine delivery. I think we are up to week of February 15th. So here we go. Don't pay attention to that. This is all your data here. And let's see here is um, now what we're doing is we're looking at the total of the second Pfizer shipments and the total allocation of the Moderna shipments. And I think we have till April before another vaccine comes on board. I don't know if the Johnson and Johnson's ready yet. Complete vaccine administration. Here's your population. Here's your current total. So it looks like it's a long road to go. If vaccines are even going to be needed, when you have when you have cases dropping this fast, you can almost you can't even vaccinate as fast as the cases are dropping. I mean, soon you'd be vaccinated against ghost is the best way I could describe it because it why why allocate the resources if it's not necessary why expose people to risk I mean yeah COVID could always mutate through antigenic shift or antigenic drift uh, or another lab escape there's no yeah, but you can't weaponize uncertainty you can't do that it's like asking people to leave the house with a helmet on in case they trip and fall no the, no you you better utilize your states of emergency for actual states of emergency all right so there's that and there's your population your current total percentage vaccinated these are numbers in a data frame broken down as you can see alaska is about 23.83 percent even though it has two people in the icu i guess at the point of time for covid or two percent maybe and then here's your numbers and of course new york is always the mystery to me because i can never figure out now remember this is not the percentage of people vaccinated this right here is if the percentage of vaccines, if distributed effectively, would have resulted in 13.92% of the people being vaccinated. But however, the actual vaccine rates tend to be much less uh, than the actual amount of vaccines being distributed. There should be tons. No one should have any problem finding a vaccine. Let's just put it that way, because there are far more vaccines out there if they're being delivered accordingly if these numbers are correct they are actually be administered to individuals unless they have unless they have not enough people to administer the vaccines who knows but in new york again everything else has been pretty uniform except for whatever is the state of new york and there's our dates as of february 10th that we're looking at and let's see what we have here i think are we done nope here's our hospital to vaccine comparison uh instead patient bed utilization, IC bed utilization, vaccine levels. So here we are as far as the 
ICU. And uh, again, I got that no, don't pay attention to the number for Alaska. It becomes an outlier and throws off all the other data. Do, 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 do. So we're going down, 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 down. Here's your, this is getting a little bit bigger chart. This is basically all of our vaccine deliveries. And you can see at the last moment here, I think the green. Yeah, well, no, that was actually nowhere past that. Yeah, but otherwise, yeah, the light blue. So they did boost the vaccine shipments a little bit in a few of the major states, uh, but nothing compared to the way it was uh, right after December 14th. And so here we go. Vaccine levels, no, don't pay attention to that anymore because that's the data should be actually changed to, I don't have to run the whole data frame anymore, but it should be changed obviously today. It's the total. And I think that is about it. So not a lot to report on, but I hope you find some of the information at least uh, curious, if at, at worst. So, but however, though, looking at disinfectant use, uh, I regret they didn't report on this earlier because it could save a lot of people a lot of hardship. Just look for less reactive disinfectants. I'm not saying don't disinfect. Just saying look for less reactive ones. Uh, that are less likely to cause lungs to become inflamed or basically completely obliterate your microbiome, uh, so to say, or more natural ones, uh, be a better opportunity. Then also, too, uh, let's see what they're saying here. Spray, bleach, uh, increase, yeah. Again, just cleaner ones. Apple cider vinegar and water work really well for a lot of people. Soap and water, uh, just things which are safer. Uh, basically, the coronavirus as the numbers began to settle and less uh, hyperbole is out there seems to be worse than the flu as uh, far as the first year being introduced into our global society if uh, if the did not you know if not earlier but however though there we are at 1.5 and as time goes on it probably will go down looks like we're on trajectory to be basically uh, a very past tense event then Many people have natural immunity to naturally armed against it. I don't want to say immunity, it's wrong words. Uh, basically, they have antibodies for it as far as helping fight it. Uh, as opposed to the very beginning, remember they said no one has any immune system against it. Mm, yeah, all right, no. So, and then also too, just for entertainment value, what 5G is really going to be heading for and headed for not necessarily to mutate viruses per se, but however, though, it's going to be used primarily more to detect emotions, whether you like it or not, and therefore help alert authorities to individuals if they get too angry, in which case they'll be at my house a lot. All right, otherwise, <laughs> outside of that, yeah, if you're any avid video game player, for example, trust me, that, yeah, that's, that's, uh, they may have to shut things like Fortnite down. But otherwise, outside of that, uh, hope you enjoyed. Catch you on Tuesday for our regular research uh, analysis. I think this week we'll do a reference to, I think, substances in Apple and helping restore uh, certain areas of the brain fairly effectively. So I think that's going to be a really, really good, uh, important uh, uh, research article to cover. Again, Ralph Channel signing off. Pay attention to the data. Uh, pay attention to this especially. See what happens. We'll see if it carries on to next week. And if it does, that slope is just profound. Again, Ralph Trajan is on off. Catch you all next week. And thank you very, very much for watching. And I'll, again, it's, I'm repeating myself because it's 223. All right, I'll see you all later on. Bye.